Good morning. It is Thursday, June 11th, 2015. This is your morning edition on I-24 News. Coming up later today, with less than a month to the Iranian deal deadline, we'll take a closer look at the Middle East in one of its crucial times in history. And where does Israel stand in the reshaping map of the region? While Israelis celebrate Hebrew literature during Hebrew Week, Hebrew Book Week, Arab culture in the country has little reason for cheer. And later on the show, the eighth conference of states' parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is being held in New York these days. A closer look at the agenda. Good morning, I am Yael Levy, and we begin straight here in the region. As the clock ticks down towards the deadline for a historic deal between Iran and world powers, the Middle East finds itself in a state of upheaval. Its traditional alliances shattered, making way for new ones. The last year alone has seen the rise of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, motivated by a brutal version of Islam. Its volunteer fighters coming from all over the region and the world have put standing armies to shame, reshaping borders and inspiring additional insurgencies in North and East Africa. ISIS advances have also created curious partnerships, like the unspoken alliance between Washington and Tehran, former foes who now find themselves sharing a common enemy. In Syria, a civil war that has been grinding on, for, on, has been grinding on for four years, costing more than 200,000 lives and producing millions of refugees, has also shuffled the deck, pitting Turkey against the Assad regime and pushing the region's Kurds towards greater autonomy. Meanwhile, in Yemen, sectarian tensions are growing even stronger, with a Sunni coalition led by Saudi Arabia employing its military might against the Iranian-backed Shiite Houthi militia. It is clear that every player in the region on the chessboard that is the ever-changing map of the Middle East has a stake in the game as evident from the rhetoric about Syria, be it Yemen, where proxy wars are being waged as means to an end between Iran and Saudi. Let's have a listen first to some of the things said over the course of the last weeks by regional key players. Everyone should feel in danger because of ISIS. This is not a threat to the resistance in Lebanon or to one specific sect or the regime in Syria or to the government in Iraq or to a group in Yemen. No, this is a danger to everyone. No one should bury their heads in the sand. The tribes need support and backup with the weapons. These are the basic issues that need to be focused on in our battle against ISIS. ISIS is always described as Sunni, but the Sunnis are innocent. The relation between Syria, the Russian Federation, and the Islamic Republic of Iran is deeper than some people think. They have never been late to provide support for our tenacity. Putting aside the Arab rhetoric that is being said, the question remains, where does Israel fit into all of this? For Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the current situation offers opportunities, and let's hear what he had to say, curiously enough, in the Herzliya conference that closed two days ago. I said there was opportunity, and I think everyone here understands it, because the trepidation of the Sunni states from Iran on the one hand and uh, ISIS on the other and everyone else creates a change and a potential for cooperation, perhaps even to resolve the problem that we want to resolve with the Palestinians. I don't think it will change the Middle East, mind you. I think you understand that. It's not going to affect uh, on Nusra or uh, ISIS, those savages, it's not going to affect Iran either. But it might affect us because we don't want a one-state solution. I don't want a one-state solution. To help us make sense of all of it, we are joined in studio by editor of What and the of, of the What and the Why dot com, fabulous website. <laughs> Former foreign editor of Sky News, Tim Marshall. Good to have you Bokotov. in studio. Bokotov. By Israel Public Radio Arab Affairs correspondent. This is like a party today. Hi, good morning. Um, exactly. Iran Zinger, good to have you in Hi. studio. And by our one and only I24 News diplomatic correspondent, Tal Shalit. Hey, now, before we begin this, I actually, you know what, Tal, I want to start with you because we were just discussing off camera, so to speak. How did Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu 
pull what we we here sitting know is the Saudi Arabia initiative the old Saudi Arabia initiative out of the hat yet again and is there actually credibility to it that Israel is looking to find an Arab alliance within the region well, it, there is a credibility to the fact that Netanyahu is definitely emphasizing uh, the new regional opportunities and the new regional common shared interests he shares with primarily uh, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. And this uh, goes primarily on the Iran deal and the decline of the U.S. influence in the region. Both the U.S. and Saudi Arabia are, are, are used to be uh, staunch allies of the U.S. Um, in the Middle East, right. and both of them are feeling that uh, um, the U.S. might be abandoning that uh, um, that traditional alliance by signing the Iran deal. Uh, Netanyahu actually is serving as a much more vocal spokesman of this alliance, while the Saudi king and uh, Saudi Arabia does it more quietly. But there, for instance, uh, the Saudi decision to ban the uh, Camp, da Camp David summit last month was associated by um, some uh, uh, commentators as uh, done by Israeli, as influenced mm -hmm. by Israel. So uh, in that respect, uh, there is a shared interest. But the, and there are uh, uh, there are contacts behind closed doors and behind the scene co contacts, mainly in intelligence against Iran for years. But can this move forward without Israel making a real move toward the Arab Peace Initiative? Probably not. It cannot move to the public front without Israel making a significant move um, towards the Palestinians. You no, know, and, and that's the article that's, that's interesting. Um, uh, before the bigger picture, Iran, is this something that the Saudis can afford to put themselves out there, you know, and actually, I'm not going to say shake hands, but can they afford to put themselves out there when these proxy wars are taking place right now in the Middle Let's East? Let's go back to history, okay? Please. History only four years ago. This is the history I'm talking about. The what we used to call the Arab Spring. We are now witnessing the end or the, the outcome of the failure of the Arab Spring. We are now witnessing the vacuum which has been created by the terrible um, results of the Arab Spring. Now, this vacuum must be filled by someone or some, some powers, and we are dealing with the Iranians, which are trying to get into this vacuum, ISIS and all of the extreme groups uh, and, and others. This is the new order in the Middle East right now. This is the new reality. We cannot use the same terminology that we used no, that we used to use. No, I'm not talking about 20 or 15 years ago. I'm talking about three years ago. It's it's all changing right now, and this is why the Saudis and others are are looking at things and saying, we we now have to understand who is our main enemy. Israel is not one of them. Now I think that what, what this situation was not as as dangerous in the past because the Iranians have been trying to get their nuclear um, uh, capability for, for 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 20 years but the Iranians were never inside of Syria Iraq Lebanon and Yemen this is the great change and this is why one should see that the Saudis are now looking at things differently asking themselves questions should we change our way of acting with Israel in order to block the Iranians now Tim because you've covered this region so many for so many years you've actually been to Iran around 2009 where there was yes yeah, several times are they becoming the next player? Is there going to be a deal? And in that respect, where do you think that puts Israel in their alliances? Well, I think in the short term, June the 30th may have to get pushed again. There is many ways of fudging a deal and, and making it look as if, yes, we've agreed to agree that we'll agree later on. To agree. And I th I, at the moment, I don't see how that agreement, I don't see it being there. Right. But that plays into what the first two guests were talking about. The push, the diplomatic push is going to come this September when the Arab Peace Initiative will be put back on the table and the Israelis will signal very clearly, we're interested in this. They will put a team together at the UN and elsewhere. And there's two reasons for it. One reason is uh, easy. The Europeans are going to have a go at Israel. In the it's next, happening. Yeah. Yeah. And there may even be talk of sanctions, and the mood in Europe is changing. If you want to push away any threat of sanctions, I'm not saying it could ever get through, but even the threat, you have to look as if you are now on the back on the diplomatic track for Israel-Palestine. They're going back on the diplomatic track for Israel-Palestine in the autumn, or the fall, as the Americans right. would say. The Kerry Initiative never got anywhere. The French are now playing big. And the key to it is that you take the Saudi initiative. You may not get all 50-odd Muslim nations on board, but you can take the Saudis because they're scared witless at the moment. You can take Jordan. You can take probably e Sisi's Egypt uh, and then some of the North African states. And with that, you can have a push in the autumn 
let's take a look at this initiative. Let's start moving again. And I think the credibility issue of Netanyahu is the one to ask, is the one to look at when, if this scenario is real in the autumn. But before we continue, joining us on the phone also is former Shin Bet director and science minister Yaakov Perry from the opposition, Yesh Atid Party. Mr. Perry, good morning to you. Good morning, Yehiv. Now, I know that you and I have sat in the studio and you've mentioned the fact that you actually came with a plan to Prime Minister Netanyahu over the course of your time in his former coalition of trying to get into some form of an alliance with certain Arab nations, but there was no reception. Is there cause in your mind to believe Prime Minister Netanyahu that at this point, as Tim Marshall just said, around the fall, that initiative will be put back on the table and the Israeli Prime Minister will be receptive to it? Well, first of all, I hope because in the past, till now, Mr. Netanyahu only declared here and there, but haven't done or haven't moved uh, to any uh, direction. Uh, we have to, to look at, at things uh, um, uh, and, to, and to say the truth. All the rounds uh, last years, including the last one, with the Palestinians, with the bilateral um, uh, negotiation, uh, failed. Uh, and now, especially after Protective Edge, uh, we are sharing with the uh, big, moderate Arab countries, mainly uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Jordan and Morocco and the majority of the Gulf countries, at least two main interests. The one that you already talked about, the anti-Iranian uh, interest, and the second, the war against the radical Islam. So uh, everybody understands that no Arab country will join Israel in any initiative, regional initiative, without putting inside the bilateral uh, track with the Palestinians. Exactly. But I think it's doable mainly because uh, Saudi Arabia and other states are afraid from Iran even more than Israel, and it will facilitate the Palestinian track, because they will get a um, backing uh, a, uh, and a financial or economical aid from the biggest moderate uh, Arab countries, and Israel should initiate such a step. It sounds almost like like an utopia, and I want to very much thank you, um, uh, Mr. Perry, for being with us, because you already present. You said you presented that to um, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister. But here's the million-dollar question, and, and Iran, I'm going to start with you. Are the Palest is that track something that is viable also, the Israeli-Palestinian track, which, know, which we know needs to be handed to several Arab states, states such as Saudi Arabia, if they're going to go to bed, so to speak, with Israel? Is that something that can be opened up again on the Palestinian side? I believe that the Palestinians, um, that, that the Arabs will, some of the Arab countries will try to convince the Palestinians to go forward with this this new reality or this new uh, the, with the steps that should be taken uh, right now especially when they try to to uh, block uh, the Iranians and the others um, but is it going to be demanded as part of it from 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 states like Saudi let me give you uh, uh, um, the example coming from Gaza we know today that the Saudis and the Egyptians are trying to to let's say to to open a new page with Hamas with the leadership of Hamas Hamas is now torn between the Iranians and the Saudis the military wing of Hamas is still controlled by the Iranians they are trying to 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 work together again this is why we would there is a possibility that we'll see in some new launches of missiles coming from uh, as a direction of the military wing but at the same time the political wing of Hamas is now being chased by the Saudis. And the Saudis are trying to tell them, listen, we have a greater risk right now, a greater danger in the area. Israel is not one of them. We ask you, Hamas, to come back to the Sunni Islam. Don't be part of the Iranians. So this is an example that I give when I'm asked about the Palestinians. I think that we'll see more and more attempts by the Saudis and the others to persuade the Palestinians to go with a new order. This is the same order that, that Netanyahu was talking about. Uh, by the way, it was declared a year ago, not only a few days ago, a year ago, at the end of the military operation in Gaza, Netanyahu said there is a new political horizon. This is the political, this is horizon, the political horizon he's talking horizon. about. Yeah. The problem is just that for Netanyahu's declaration, at declarations at this point, I think, are not enough 
enough for the international community and not enough for the Palestinians. He will, he will have to support them with actions. And for Netanyahu to support them with actions, such as a settlement freeze or a semi-settlement freeze, even though there is even a non-official settlement freeze as we speak, but an official settlement freeze, that entails compromises, political compromises from Netanyahu's point of view. That will mean a political shift inside the Israeli coalition, something that Netanyahu is definitely um, ha uh, happy to accept. But this means political implications from Netanyahu's point of view. His current narrow right-wing <clears throat> government will not move forward with and, any acceptance and, of the Arab peace and initiative. And this I may add, there's another element, the absence of the American player. The Americans, and, and there we have it. The no, Americans the are of out of here. They're not. They're not in. They're not in the region anymore. Now, I'm not talking only about the American troops in Iraq no, and no, no, other no, places. No, no, no. They the, don't the, care. The diplomatic America is not here anymore to help us in the in the region. We already have the French now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Thank that's you. A terrifying notion. But um, I said that. But and, and that's exactly the point that, that I'm wondering out loud because it leads us to Europe. But it is it is exactly that in lines that the American President Obama has been saying over the course of the last several um, uh, weeks, as he did to an Israeli um, uh, interviewer, Ilana Dayan, a week ago, making a point that it is not top of the agenda for the United States to basically meddle in the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Let's have a listen to what Obama had to say. Uh, I, I, think, I think subsequently his statements uh, have suggested that there is the possibility of a Palestinian state. but. It has so many caveats, so many conditions, that it is not realistic to think that those conditions would be met any time in the near future. Right. And so the danger here uh, is that Israel as a whole loses credibility. And as going to him, uh, to Ron Zinger's point, Tim, that the Americans, President Obama has made it very, very, very clear that mm -hmm. this is not top of the agenda of the Israeli-Palestinian yeah. issue. But if we're looking at an Arab initiative with Saudi, Israel is going to have to give something. Is Europe going to push Israel over the brink, so to speak, to make concessions in order to push that south? I mean, how, because everybody's discussing the European, you know, pressure on Israel over the course of the last several, uh, several weeks. Sometimes it's feel, it feels as if it's blown out of proportion. Is it really something that we're going to look at over the course of the next couple the of months? The Europeans have got better things to worry about than you. Yeah, I know. Trust me. And so, Hard and so to believe, very, I know. It's amazing, yeah. but they don't all wake up and think, what are we going to do you with Israel? Israel? But I mean, yeah. it's, you know, when yeah. you're obsessed as I am with yeah. the subject, you, you think that's the case. Israel has to push itself over the brink, I and mean, yeah. it can be helped to do that uh, by European pressure, and that is going to come as well. And I do think it will be led by the Europeans, because, as we've pointed out, the Americans are not in the game at the moment. They will come back to the game. Uh, Kerry has got his broken leg. Obama has got his broken administration. <laughs> we've only got a year. They're all in... Uh, Iran. Uh, uh, ISIS Iran. Uh, they're in, they're, that's, that's what they're worried about, and then they're worried about the election. So they're not going to concentrate, but they can... There's, there's bandwidth, as they say. But there is, there, is a, uh, there is something I want to emphasize. I think that should be emphasized here. It's not only that the Americans are out of the game, as you've just mentioned. They are saying, and the American administration is saying, OK, we are out of the game. Let's find someone yes. else to get into this vacuum. And what? And I, I think that the, that the greater, the greater, let's say, um, struggle between between Israel and the Arabs against the U.S. is is the American thinking or the way of American thinking saying, if we are not here, let's let's talk to the Iranians. The Iranians are strong enough. They can be the one who will get into this vacuum. Maybe the Iranians are strong enough to, 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 to control what's going on in the region. That's why it's a new time. Yeah, why, this is why I'm saying. Because the, the, the interests are finally coinciding. And also, we can, I think we'll probably come on to Syria. At the moment, the Syria is changing, and the, the reason it's changing is that the big powers have put their shoulder to the wheel and are pushing. You can never resist it, whether it's Bosnia, Kosovo, or, or, or Israel and Palestine. When the big powers put their shoulders to the wheel, things change. And in Syria, they're changing because the weapons have finally started to arrive. The diplomatic wheel is now turning. It will turn in the autumn. Now, you're asking me specifics about, well, what compromises. I mean, that's the level of detail that right. you guys know far more than I do. I'm talking about a big picture where you will find the European pushing, you'll find the Arab states willing to explore, and you'll find the Israeli government of Bibi Netanyahu willing to explore, can we go down this road? Is there any way we can go? Now, where it ends, that we don't know. Is the Israeli government tell willing to explore that? Well, 
I think these, Netanyahu himself is definitely yeah, ready yes. to explore that. The but question is not about the, the Netanyahu coalition. himself, it's his That's partners, but Netanyahu, since the beginning of this, uh, since he was, since the beginning of his term, since the elections, he has been saying again and again that 61 is nice, but more mm -hmm. than 61 <laughs> is better. But you don't, you don't need your coalition to go down the foreign policy track of beginning the openings, and, and it will begin and it will open. No, actually, I'm just saying it's actually what Netanyahu would probably yeah. like to have. He yeah. would like to have an excuse that would have Naftali Bennett and the Jewish home, the Vero, the, the more radical right, leave the government and right. have an excuse to push in Buji Herzog or Yair Lapid to tell that if there's a diplomatic initiative on the table, that one of these two will not be able to say well, no. no. They will have an excuse there, to yeah, enter the government. With all due respect to the problematic crisis of ISIS, the Israeli coalition is much harder to solve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, they, we're talking detail. <laughs> again, and of course, you have to talk detail at some point. But again, the the, the, the point remains: there is something moving. Yeah. We just, which is good, but you don't know where it goes. Yeah, we have no idea where it's going. But you know, and, and we'll see. And time will tell, so to speak. And I think June is a defining moment for that. I want to thank you all for this bit of um, uh, for this bit of topic as we move along. staying as we move to our next item in which we take a closer look obviously at what is going on in Syria and the way they're and the way Syria is presented in the world media the following report will update us on the recent events in the war in the war shattered country actually that is Syria whatever is left of it and uh, take it and break it down from there pressure on the regime of Syrian president Bashar al-Assad is not letting up Rebel forces have been making significant progress in recent weeks and months, and on Tuesday, an alliance of rebel groups, known as the Southern Front, consisting of both Islamist and moderate forces, said it had managed to capture a major Syrian army base known as the 52nd Brigade, close to the city of Dara, near the Jordanian border. The base is the second largest army facility in southern Syria, and its relative proximity to the capital Damascus gives it strategic value. It represents yet another setback for the regime after the fall of Palmyra to Islamic State jihadists last month, while Islamist rebels have also managed to capture most of Idlib province in northwestern Syria since March. But fighting continues in the province even now, with innocent bystanders often paying the price. The village of al Janudia in western Idlib was the site of regime airstrikes, which included the use of barrel bombs. A human rights group says 49 civilians were killed in the strikes in al Janudia, among them six children and ten women. The group said 18 more civilians were killed by regime barrel bombs in Al-Rastan, north of the city of Homs. Many see these strikes as further indication of the regime's increasingly desperate state, as rebel forces continue to advance toward remaining regime strongholds in the west and along the coast. As fighting drags on, representatives of moderate rebel groups met in Cairo for a two-day meeting focused on Syria's future. The power balance now is between dictatorship and terrorism. The democratic forces are marginalized day by day. The only way forward is a strong position from the international community, abiding the regional countries to support a political peaceful solution to end this war. Some see Assad's troubles as an opportunity to force a political solution to Syria's crisis, though what would actually remain of Syria in such a scenario is unlikely to resemble what once was. Still in, uh, um, with us in studio, obviously, running until 11, and Tim Marshall. What will remain of Syria? Tim, let's start with you. You actually came here both for the Herzliya conference, but also to do a story about Syria. I want to start there with what remains of Syria. Is there a Syria? Actually? No, there isn't. There are competing warlords, and Bashar Assad remains the biggest warlord uh, of the competing warlords. But the situation there it's has changed. It's a warlord um, war, yeah. Yeah. Um, what it, what we saw Base 52 fall there. It looks like Al Thawa Air Base. Maybe it's fallen. If it's true, then Sueda province is crumbling for the regime. If Sueda province crumbles, then they'll have to pull back to um, Damascus. I have been told that recently two Druze villages had uh, uh, tanks in them, and they tried to pull them out. And the Druze said, you're not leaving us behind. And they refused to let the Syrian army take the tanks back up to Damascus. Now, there is now a split between the Druze and the regime. And it's very significant. I know they're only 4% of the population, but strategically in certain areas, they're very important. And the Druze are now approaching decision time. Do we stay with the regime or do we find an alliance? Or there is a third way, which just says, both of you back off and let us know when you're finished. But they tried that and they got sucked in. Right. So I th they're going to have to make a decision because the Assad forces are going to run away. 
What are the Jews going to do then? Well, they better get in with the FSA, and I think it's possible they might even switch sides. Look, it's not unheard of of people switching sides in the middle of, of multiple faceted civil mm -hmm. wars. So I, th I think that's what's happening at the moment. I think this, this coming story is the piece of the jigsaw which has the Druze in it. And Iran, you know, it's been four years, though, with Syria. And I think it's very, it's a pivot, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're the expert on this, that it's a pivotal player on the map when it comes to what we discussed earlier. If that happens with Syria, I mean, first of all, what are we looking at in Syria? This cannot be resolved in the next, you know, several weeks, so to speak. Yeah, right. Well, as um, Tim just said, um, I think that we're, what we're witnessing is the collapse of a week. <laughs> Syria has already collapsed, uh, and Bashar al-Assad is going to rule not Damascus. I think that eventually he will rule the Alawite region in the western part, of the coastal part of Syria. This is this is what's going to happen. The fallback right? position. Yes. The fallback. Now, the Syrian With the Druze arm, becoming now the defining somewhat, somewhat of the defining. Yeah. If in, if in the past <laughs> we used to see on, on on Syrian TV declarations saying that. Our, our brave soldiers will uh, set free the town or the village of blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> now they're saying our soldiers have just withdrawn from this, this place or another place. They're, they're now confirming that they are withdrawing. In other words, what Assad is now doing, he is sending his troops to the places that he's still yeah. controlling. I would say that there is a, a difference between the geographic withdrawals and the demographic uh, withdrawals. In other words, he is not is not um, controlling or is not taking is not ruling more more than 25 percent of Syria when it comes to the to the to the size of Syria when uh, the, the ge geographic side of Syria but he's now controlling he's still controlling the vast majority of the population I'm, I'm talking about the major cities he's yes. still there still but it's not it's, it, it, it would change and as you said as you've just said about the Druze the Druze are in a, in a major problem because it is well known that the Druze community in Israel in Lebanon in Syria they're always very loyal to the regime or to the right. to, to the country they, they live in for them it's a major problem because once they decide that they go against Assad, it will also have an effect on what's going on in Lebanon. Mm. Because, let me remind you, the Druze are out of the game in Lebanon. But once you have Druze against Assad in Syria, wow. you will, you'll have Druze against Assad and, and Druze against Hezbollah in Lebanon. If you look at Wally Jumblatt's mm. diary at the moment, it's pretty full. It's pretty full <laughs> <laughs> in Lebanon. Sadly, all the time we have, because it's fascinating, but I have a feeling that we're going to take a closer look at this all the way leading up to the end of June. Uh, when we get back, a conference to mark the first Arab Book Week was held this week in the Israeli parliament. Let's take a look if it helped them. But first, of course, as in every morning, the morning headlines. Still Thursday, June 11th. Oh my God. <laughs> that was scary for a second there. <laughs> it's the pink. 2015, joined in studio by, of course, Ami Kaufman, which we'll do the spiel in a second, but also Iman Siksak, who I am very happy to have you physically here. Good for morning. The, yeah, good yeah. morning for the item that will come after this. But for now, Ami Kaufman, with all the news you've missed while scanning the headlines and anything that's important to know. Take it away. Let's take it away. Okay, this has the components of a great story. Of course, it has Iran, it has Israel, it has malware. Mal it has malware. Yes! And it has the Wall Street <laughs> Journal, of course. Okay. Uh, uh, it has. It's, it's going to be the next Hollywood movie, you know that. Yeah, of okay. course. Now, yeah. uh, the Wall Street Journal is reporting about uh, that a spy virus is linked to Israel uh, targeting hotels used for the Iran nuclear talks. How did this whole thing start? Please. The uh, Moscow based cybersecurity firm called Kaspersky is one of the largest, most reliable, actually, uh, firms for detecting malware. Uh, and they found, they were hacked, actually, last year, uh, probably by, uh, by a virus that's called Duku. Now, Duku is actually well known to be a virus that is used by what they call Israeli spies. Um, but uh, it's the it's the signature. It's it, the it signature. Is, it is Israeli. Yeah, wow. It is. Uh, we, we remember the Stuxnet before. This is called Duku. Yes. Um, so they, they wanted to know uh, who else was targeted by this, so they checked millions and millions of computers. They didn't find anything except for a few computers that happened to be in three hotels in Switzerland and Austria. They did not know what uh, was in common with these hotels until wow. they found out, that, oh, these wow. hotels were, were uh, hosting nuclear talks between Iran and the other uh, uh, superpowers. So uh, uh, yeah. the Kaspersky in this report doesn't actually exactly say that Israel did the spying. Specifically? But, they did, but what they did say was interesting, that they subtly kind of hinted, they called this new strain of Duku, they called it Duku Bet. <laughs> 
using, of course, the second the letter second of the letter Hebrew of the alphabet, like Duku B. Uh, so I, I thought that was kind of cute on the part. Yeah, the, on the part of the yeah <laughs> uh, uh, of the journal. Wow. Yeah. Um, I'm waiting to see the fallout from this story. Probably. Yeah, this cannot be really help uh, the already no, strained relations no, between. No, uh, no, yeah, yeah, you between know, the, Obama. The Israelis and the, are spying on the U.S. On no. the U.S. I'm already going to call the relationship between Netanyahu and Obama. It's not even Israel and the U.S. Yeah. already anymore. Yes. Okay, off quickly to uh, Pakistan. Uh, despite uh, worldwide uh, protests and condemnations, they executed a man who was 15 when he was convicted of murder. He murdered three people. Apparently, he, by the way denies this. Uh, the man is Afta Bahadur. He's a 38-year-old Christian. He spent 22 years on death row. Um, but uh, 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 at the time of his conviction, 1992, it was legal for them to sentence him to death, uh, although the age was raised to 18 in 2000. Now, what's interesting is that there was a moratorium on capital punishment in uh, Pakistan, True. but uh, they recently took that off. They used to cancel because of this uh, massacre of, uh, of uh, school children in Peshawar in December. And they said, okay, we're going to stop. We're, we're going to continue them. executing people. But I, 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 this is kind of strange. You know, he had nothing to do with this, of course. It was a, it was a sort of deterrent against Taliban uh, militants. I can't see no, why. I mean, what, what is the, terrifying what going about to get this, this, and I think it goes to show that when something becomes a modus operandi of a country, then it's oh, it's all consuming. So somebody who was 15 at the time of the crime, right. whether he, you know did it or not, yeah. is going to fall under that you know under that umbrella, which is sad and terrifying. 22 years on death row. That's wow. Yeah. How do you live with that? Um, Abortion is always a hot topic, of course, on Ameri in American uh, uh, election committees. Yeah. It's coming up pretty soon. This woman is probably going to star in, in the, uh, some, uh, the trial is going to start. She has, she's going to be charged with murder be because she took an abortion pill when her fetus, uh, the fetus in her, in her was about five, five months, months old. Five months old. She took the pill. Uh, she started feeling bad. Her neighbor drove her to the hospital. She gave birth in the car Just to a fetus, and 30 minutes later, the fetus died. The cops arrested her for taking that pill that she bought online. It's called Cytotec. Where, uh, in what, in, in what this is, state This is this in happen? Atlanta, in, in, in Atlanta. Georgia. Yeah. Uh, abortions in Georgia are only allowed by law in the first trimester unless they're carried out at a licensed medical facility. So this is already the second trimester, um, and she is going to be charged this with is, murder. Uh, listen, horrifying, uh, horrifying, 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 nonetheless, it's, I'm, I'm going to say something terrible. It goes to show yet again that in the United States, a woman's decisions over her body are not her own. That's right. And that is, to me, it's mind-boggling in the 21st century. Right, and this we're going to hear a lot about this, yeah, I think, this, definitely. this trial. Yeah, definitely, uh, Keeping uh, with the states, we know how we do a little media comparison thing. Uh, this is a really interesting story. It's, uh, Marco Rubio, who is a Republican candidate for president. One of many. And one of many. One <laughs> yes. of, uh, probably is going to be at least a dozen candidates, if not more. Um, <clears throat> I feel like running for and the Republican candidate. And his little, uh, his little uh, war that's going on with the New York Times. Very interesting. New York Times uh, yesterday put out a report in June 9th about how he has problems with how he manages his finances. Uh, he uh, recently got uh, $800,000 to write a book, but afterwards, and, and he, you know, he, uh, he, he spent $80,000 on a yacht and $50,000 on an Audi. Uh, he never really had a lot of money. So, you know, the New York Times put this piece up. The problem is, as we can see in the next item, this piece came only two or three days after an earlier piece that the New York Times put out, which is about parking, uh, speeding violations by the Rubio couple, him and his spouse. Over the past few years, they've received about 17 citations. A lot of critique against the New York Times, where, you know, what do you, this guy... No, they're gunning for Rubio. Yeah, they're, they're, they're okay, gunning for this, him. He himself only had four citations over 15 years in New York, and people are saying, the New York Times, what are you doing? Why, why, why are you looking at this guy's yeah. citations? And why are you attacking his wife? So as you can see in the next item, Political says, New yes. York Times opened the door uh, for Rubio. The, the, the people, the Republican Party and Rubio are lapping this up because the best thing that a Republican loves to do is attack the New York Times. They love this. And yeah, the even, New York even, Times gives Rubio an opening, even, and my look, word. Look, and and, and uh, his, uh, his campaign manager is so happy he tweeted this tweet that we can see uh, where he says the that tweet. something yes. you won't hear from me often, this guy's name is Terry Sullivan, something Terry you won't Sullivan. hear from me often, thank you, New York Times. They're <laughs> loving it. They're loving it because what, because what they say is New York Times looks like, uh, excuse me, Ro uh, Marco Rubio looks like an average man who ha does not have money like the rest of the people, like, like, the, the, Bushes, the, people like the Clintons, and he's not rich, and he once in a while does things, you know, like he uh, drives too fast. He's, I'm he's sorry, that is what happens when the newspaper is run by white men. It's very true. It's very true. <laughs> I, and an opening for me to say that. To his rescue comes the Washington Post, who they say, you know, the New York Times is actually doing its job. Marco Rubio, we don't know a lot of Mar about Marco Rubio. Uh, we have to vet him. He's not vetted like any other candidate. We don't know much about him. Let's vet him uh, and, and uh, let's see who this he, This guy's a major contender. He's 43 years old. Why are he people might be so president. surprised? Yeah. yeah, there's truth to that as well. But to me, it's also one big institution standing up for another big institution. Yeah. But fascinating to see that's something, you know, I think the American elections are going to give us a lot to play with. Oh, yeah, before, yeah totally. <laughs> as they're running along. <laughs> as we move along now and coming back and bring us back to the Middle East. 
back in the joyful region that is the Middle East. Around the country, though, in Israel, or sitting here, Israelis are celebrating Hebrew Book Week. But for the country's Arab citizens, there is little reason for cheer. With a new right-wing government in place and new ministers eager to flex their political muscles, two incidents that made major headlines here this week bode ill for the future. On Tuesday, Education Minister Naftali Bennett ordered to remove a play by an Arab writer from the ministry's list of state-sponsored events offered to schools. Bennett claimed that the play, a semi-biographical story about a Palestinian prisoner, glorified terrorists. And a day later, Culture Minister Miri Regev threatened to cut funding from a theater group operated by actor Norman Issa, an Arab Israeli, because Issa had refused to perform in a play scheduled to be put on in a Jordan Valley settlement. We're joined in studio by Atomy Foreign News correspondent Ayman Siksek. Ayman, great to have you here. Let's first watch your report and break it down from there. Within Hebrew Book Week, now in full swing across Israel, Arabic literature in Israel seems to have dropped out of sight. In a special meeting in the Israeli parliament on Wednesday, Arab members of the Knesset said the insult has for them become a personal one. Isawi Frej's idea is so simple, it seems unlikely it has not come true already. Launching an Arab Book Week, a nationwide celebration of Arabic literature, which, like the Hebrew Book Week, would be supported by the state. Starting next year, the Arab Book Week will be held at the same time as the Hebrew one. We are also planning on launching an award program for authors in Arabic, as this is sorely missing for our authors. Joining Frej in this initiative is influential literary critic Ariana Melamid. The absence of books is what really frightens me and the absence of uh, government funding for Arab local libraries and programs of literacy. This is what I would like to bring back. This I think is my privilege and my duty as a citizen. But if all intentions in this prospect are good, why is the availability of Arabic books in Israel so scarce? The answer is security. In order for a business or public library in Israel to request and obtain Arabic books from locations labeled as enemy countries, namely Saudi Arabia, Iran, or Syria, a special approval is required from the Israeli security agency. The approval can take long periods of time to be issued, if at all. For writers of Arabic literature within Israel, this complication is a barrier between them and fellow writers in neighboring countries. This is a welcome step to establish an award program for writers in Arabic because it promotes the Arabic language and culture in a country of two identities and two languages. A hopeful dream put forth today in the corridors of the Israeli parliament in a country where culture and the written word are also engaged in battle. Ayman Siksek with me in studio. I think it's important to note also that you yourself are an author and an Arab Israeli. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot. Um, uh, But I'm I'm bringing also on the phone joining us is the joint Arab list um, uh, Knesset Minister Aida Tuma Suleiman. Um, Aida, good morning to you. Good morning. As part of, you know, the joint list, um, uh, before we start the discussion, I'll just ask you, because there's been some things that are happening over the course of the last two days in Israel, and that is putting in danger um, Arab-funded cultural locations such as a theater in Jaffa by, by Norman Issa. It seems that there, I don't want to call it a consorted effort, but is, you know what, is the joint list or the Arab-Israeli um, uh, P- um, uh, citizens of, um, of Israel worried about the cultural fabric of the society in wake of the new government? Uh, of course, we are worried. Uh, we are worried. We are also, you can say, we are a little bit angry. Actually, there is no way to uh, be calm about what happened in the last two days, the way the two ministers, uh, uh, Mira Regev, Minister of Culture, and uh, Bennett, uh, Minister of Education, have behaved as a reaction of different political attitudes that happened in the last two days. Uh, These are very, uh, uh, in my opinion, these are uh, signals to what is going to happen under those two uh, ministers and uh, the policy that uh, they want to lead towards our uh, education, our culture, and uh, uh, different institutions. uh, And if I dare say for the future hope of coexistence, I had to do stay with us. Ayman, you know, Hebrew Book Week... um, 
Uh, what, what I found very fascinating about your report was the fact that to get books that are of Arab, you know, by Arab authors, it all deals with security. Well, it's really ironic. Obviously, this is a general policy by the Shin Bet, the Israeli, the Israeli security, security. Agency. You can't import anything, obviously, from these countries. But with books, it's especially poignant. It's especially hurtful. Because for these authors, they're saying, you know, we have a relationship with other, we ought to have a relationship with other authors in neighboring Arab countries. Uh, can you imagine if we couldn't import Russian literature and we never knew who Dostoevsky was? There likely is a Dostoevsky in Saudi Arabia that we know nothing about. And the really funny thing is that these authors are often internationally successful. They're translated to several languages. And we can get the English translation of the piece here in Israel, but not the Arabic original. That's too dangerous for us to get our hands on. And that's a policy that's been going on for quite a while, actually, even it, before. That, that, that is the policy of, um, uh, of the state of Israel. Ida, I, I mean, is it, I'm, tr I'm wondering with you out loud, what will be the policy or what will be the battle of the opposition if we're looking and we're taking into the account also the last two days and what ministers within the, the new Israeli government are trying to do when it comes to funding of, um, uh, of Arab Israeli or content that is deemed by the new government as dangerous? Well, uh, uh, I think that uh, this policy is, uh, is using the funding issue uh, in order to have uh, more a political uh, effect on our culture on our future, uh, because uh, actually what uh, Bennett and uh, Regev are saying by cutting uh, budgets and finance from different institutions, you are not able to ask, you are not able to have your own uh, uh, way of thinking or to act on uh, your uh, conscience politically and uh, humanly. Uh, 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 you are uh, supposed to obey uh, blindly the right-wing policy and not even to think about uh, either protesting or uh, thinking freely. And I think this should scare not only the Arab population in Israel, not only the Palestinians in Israel. It should also scare all the uh, uh, citizens of Israel because when you start uh, 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 narrowing the democracy uh, space, uh, you are narrowing it to everybody. It starts with Arab, but it never stops with uh, Arabs. I think the opposition should uh, understand that very clearly, should act uh, against that and try to stop this attack. Uh, uh, mm on democratic I mean, no, no, one would hope that that, that, that will happen. And I'm an end, to, just to sum up the Hebrew Book Week, how many books in Arabic do one, could one find there? Well, <laughs> zero. You can find books in English in uh, the Hebrew Book Week, but this is a uh, part of a larger uh, theme here. I mean, in Tear Hour, there's a largely Arab population. Right. There are zero books in Arabic in the public libraries, and this happens mainly in uh, predominantly Arab cities. In right. Jaffa, for example, there's only one bookstore that one sells bookstore. books in Arabic. Um, uh, yes, no, ter terrifying words. I don't even know how to culminate that. I want to thank you, though, for this very important report, and, um, uh, and Aida Tumasuman joining us from um, uh, ACO as well. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. When we get back um, uh, something entirely different at this time. Access Israel, the country's leading organization for people with disabilities, hosts an unforgettable meal at the UN headquarters. We'll take a look, or maybe we'll just have a smell. I don't know. First, let's hear some more of the morning headlines. Welcome back, I-24 News Morning Edition on this June 11th. I know that because Ami Kaufman, the man, the pink, the bow tie, has told me so. You should believe it. <laughs> you should like, believe it. Yeah, I will believe it. I will. Um, and it's good to have you back with us. I am still the LV. And the next item is incredible because I have no idea what it is. But I'm going to read it from the prompter. The eighth <laughs> conference of states parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is taking place at the UN headquarters in New York this week, aims to take stock of past achievements and looks ahead at strategies for the future. The Treaty on Persons with Disabilities was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in April 2006, following five years of negotiations. The conference is also being attended by Access Israel, a nonprofit organization that promotes accessibility and integration of people
people with disabilities into society. As part of their efforts, the organization's representative hosted a group of 30, but I heard before that it was actually 40, um, international diplomats for what they call a feast for the senses. To hear more about it, and I have a feeling that to also experience more by, about it. <laughs> we are joined in studio by the Director of education of the Education Department and Program Development at Access Israel, Liat Ori Liat. Hi. Good morning to Good you. Morning. It's wonderful to have you with us. But yeah. before we turn to you, let's say hello also to Access Israel General Manager Advocate Michal Rimon joining us over the phone from New York City following the very, very, very successful night. Michal? Good hello, hello. Hello, hello. Good morning to you. Okay, tell us what happened yesterday at the UN. What did Access Israel organize for the 40 guests? Well, Access Israel, along with the uh, Israeli permanent mission to the United Nations, uh, basically invited um, 30 uh, and a little bit more uh, diplomats from all around the world to experience what we call the Feast for the Senses. Uh, which is uh, an amazing uh, experience uh, that uh, doesn't talk about any controversy, doesn't talk about any political thing, but just uh, shows a tool that Access Israel developed to make people understand how it feels to be with a disability. Right. You know, it, it's part of a, of a, a convention that's going on now in the UN, um, and instead of just talking, we showed and we enabled the people to experience firsthand how it feels. Now, terribly important because I think, you know, one can only understand what they go through and, you know, and what the hardships are for a person with a disability. Um, it, it was a success, I understand, right? It was amazing. The fact that you sit with people really from all around the world, uh, Europe and uh, Bahamas and uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, to have them participate in an evening where each uh, course, another sense is taken away from them. And uh, on the process, they uh, get to meet a person with that disability from Israel. Wow. Not uh, coming from uh, uh, complaints or, or uh, feeling sorry for themselves, but rather telling about their successes. And the their uh, ability to cope with life. And having people come to us at the end and say, Wow, we are dealing with this with this uh, subject for so long. And maybe, and, and maybe, this maybe this. We... No, no, and maybe this will make change. I'm, I'm stopping you just for a second because I'm beginning to realize <laughs> what is expected <laughs> for me here in the studio. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But Michal, st stay with us because everything you describe right now, I think. Oh. Yeah, Liat Ori, who is your friend, colleague, and somebody who scares me a little bit right now. Because <laughs> you're sitting here, Liat, with, yes. uh, with all kinds of paraphernalia and things. Yes. And this was in the dinner yesterday at the UN, I'm assuming, right? Uh, this is a taste of what was, of what was at the, the dinner. dinner. Because the dinner is a really big feast. It's a big feast yeah. and whatnot. What am I supposed to do? You basically had the delegates come in, and what did they do? They put these things on? OK, so in the main course, Usually people get blindfolded and enter into a room. Oh, you, you wanted already, okay? okay. And Which means right now that I will not be able to read the prompter and I will not be able to most likely say anything. I'm kidding. Okay, okay. we will all improvise. Yes. Anyway, the people are entering into a room with right. the, this blindfold and trying to find the, and orient their self in space using the sense of smell, real touch, okay. and even hearing, okay, because the hearing is getting... Ami, where are you? I mean, you good. Yes. We are with you. We are with you. Okay. And then usually they get a braille menu. I'm gonna. Ha I'm just yeah, gonna. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna hand you the braille out. menu. Okay. This is terrifying. I and have now to say. you can order whatever you want from the braille menu. What would you like for the? First course. Dot dot dot. Dot dot dot. Okay. Um, <laughs> wow. This is yeah. Okay. I'll okay. Have the dot, so dot 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 with the sauce. On we'll the side. we'll get get it yeah. one one step further, and I'm giving I'm putting in front of you a tray on your left hand. On my left. Okay. You can feel your first course and try maybe touch it, smell it. Maybe you will recognize what you touched, and mm. then okay. maybe even taste it. Oh, did you did you recognize? Brave. Very brave. What did you get? Uh, I'm going to kill you. I hate bananas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Sometimes blind but people. But I am hungry. Okay. <laughs> right, so, so. so imagine yourself a blind people. I, I, I knew that just from tasting. When I touched it. You didn't know what? Yeah, I had no idea what it was. But you think there is just banana on the chair? Or maybe you have anything more? You, you just. You, I'm maybe making, I will. Wait, wait. Banana, banana. 
No. No. You want to take the blindfold off so can we we can go further? <gasps> you see? Ah! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine yourself blind person come to a restaurant and getting a meal and eating uh, from one plate but he doesn't know he the doesn't whole know meal the he has m um, many more foods on the no, table. No, 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 because you kept saying tray and I couldn't I couldn't figure out, you know, where the tray was, what yeah. Okay. Jello, really? You brought me Jello. Well, let's okay. go to the next. In the main course, usually okay. we give special gloves. In these gloves, you have a wood in it. Try to put it on your hand when the. So we still have to be bl blind and with. No, the no, yeah. no. We get okay. one. There is wood. Yeah, the wood, wood should be in front of in your front palm. In front of the hand. Okay. It's very important to say that usually a person with disability is guiding you through this experience, right. telling you his story and the successes and uh, what is accessibility for him and how to do it because blind people, for example, uses the clock uh, method. Well, what is the clock method? Where you imagine the plate is a clock and I can tell you that in three o'clock you have bananas, gotcha. at twelve o'clock you have an apple, Got you, yeah. got you. Okay, it's help. So maybe you try and open the jello with the gloves, okay? <laughs> that, that's that's not Wait, wait. Okay, okay, okay. No, because I, I'm thinking of people who have to do this daily. Yeah. Okay? And my God. Um, not just eating, just grabbing just the eating. grabbing yeah. the cup, right? Uh, See if I were I'm gonna do what, what you know, what 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 becomes what I wanna do right now and I'm gonna try and do this. Yeah. <laughs> Be careful. Careful. Careful the jelly. Yes. Oh, oh. Yeah, I wow. good. Very good. Yes, okay. very good. Very Usually good. we see very important people in this stage just putting Basically. the fork and the knife and just grabbing the steak and eating like Anything like, like that. Yes. I think seriously and I hate you know harp constantly pushing the notion that I have children, but I learned this from my kid. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to open this. I'll do it with my teeth. Okay. So, but that is in in the wood and that What about eating it? Oh my god. I want I want going to help you. No, no, try don't it help yourself, me. yeah. So, if I were and I I'm just reminding viewers that I have two pieces of wood in the um, uh, in in the gloves, so I cannot move my hands. I really yes. can't move my hands. This wow. is undoable. No. Undoable. I, I don't know, how would how would somebody that has you know a handicap do this? Well, accessibility. I mean, if you need to write, there is a special pen with like rings that uh, go on your finger, and then you can write. Right. For example, uh, our um, Yuval Wagner, who founded the foundation Access Israel. Israel, is using a dog who is helping him grabbing and bringing right. stuff, but. We didn't. One last one. We did one last yeah, one. Yeah, one last one. For the dessert, we give the people special headphones. It doesn't make you feel like a deaf person, but it reduces your hearing level. And <laughs> that's so unfair. <laughs> I mean, that's great. No, no, that, that, because you know, <laughs> it, it, it's yeah. It, it looked like the, this is what I felt like. <laughs> yeah, wow. I do, yeah, yeah. Usually we get a, a sign language workshop now and people yeah. uh, getting to know how to approach someone with hearing disability, how to communicate with them, don't put your hand on your mouth, don't talk with your back, don't exaggerate what your you're way, doing, yeah, yeah. because you can't understand the projection of the words. Like and this. I mean, I know we still, I'm going to release your, your great and amazing friend from New York, Michal, I'm sorry because we're running out of time, but and I'm going to hear from you, Laurie, how important this is to really understand yeah. You know what a person with disabilities faces every single day. It's you know I'm I, I tip my hat to, for people who survive this way every single day, um, uh, but it's also driving the point home, and the fact that it was a success at the UN. Are you guys? It's it's does it mean more funding? Is there the possibility of more funding of just making awareness? For people of, um, uh, of uh, with disabilities, I hope there will be more funding. Yeah. But our main goal is to raise the awareness, to give the people not just the knowledge and the meeting with the people with this disability, but to experience it. Because we believe that when you experience it yourself, you are starting to understand what is the meaning of the disability, and then you can start and make a change Amen. from the bottom of your heart. Amen. Um, uh, beautiful. You're locked in, and you can hear and see luckily for you uh, in studio with us because the, the next item is as I always say actually Ami Kaufman with the viral spiral that is the web review but this is phenomenal and it's the UN awareness day for, for, for persons with disabilities and it's an amazing initiative I will just teach you that sign language thank you thank you <laughs> Ami
Yeah, be that. Yeah. <laughs> the viral spiral that is the web review and Ami Kaufman with the most important news of the day. Yes. Well, yes. you know, a few days ago, this I think it might big. have been actually last week, I told you about uh, uh, the new uh, uh, Simpsons season where uh, Bart Simpson will be killed by Sideshow Bob. It now looks like uh, things are going a bit too, uh, you know, fans are really ba uh, sad about this new development. Sad? Homer, Homer, sad is the mildest understatement yeah, of the Yeah, you're right, actually. Okay. You're right. Homer and Marge are to legally separate. To legally separate. People in the studio are I mean, in this shock. Is just, you know, <laughs> the fans on Twitter are just saying, you know, what, what, you know what? Don't, listen, do not air this listen, season. Listen, I, I want to say happen. something. I, you know, there are many things that have happened around the world over the course of the last year. ISIS, yeah. yes. wars in Yemen. But I have this, not lost faith in humanity. Until, until this, this. Until this. Until this. I, I just feel like walking out. Of this yeah, now I'm, done. Know. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm and you know what? He's going to fall in love, apparently, with his pharmacist, who is voiced by Lena Dunham. From, uh, from girls. Uh, girls. From girls. That is who he's It's always the young chick that comes in. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, anyway. No, okay. it's the end of the world as we know it, folks. It's the end of the world. <laughs> yeah, what do I love? I love dumb politicians on Twitter. <laughs> uh, this is one of my favorite ones. The dumb okay. This is a British guy who's from UKIP, the Conservative Party on, uh, in, in England. He's oh, a member. He's a member. <laughs> he's a member of the uh, European Parliament. He's an MEP. Now, as you can see from this uh, first, uh, from the headline, uh, he yeah. he said he's taking on Sainsbury's for uh, uh, supporting the Yes campaign of uh, uh, the, on, the, on leaving the the European uh, referendum. So right. they, 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 he says that Sainsbury's wants to stay uh, in. Uh, so he's taking on Sainsbury's. Stay in Sainsbury's. Okay. So people. Uh, who shop at Sainsbury's and who vote for UKIP are very, very angry, as we can see in this next uh, uh, tweet. Well, I won't be shopping at Sainsbury's anymore, that's for sure. <laughs> or and the next one says, just like EU, they have no regard for democracy, views, or shareholders of electorate. Shame on you, Sainsbury's. People are really mad at Sainsbury's. You can see in the next tweet, they even started calling Sainsbury's. It says, I have just rung Sainsbury's to object that they are supporting our continued membership are of you EU. And Sainsbury says, yes, we got millions of calls. They're being swamped what with calls. What do they want from Okay, I'm sorry. And the next guy says that it's a conspiracy to get more immigrant workers to, to work for Sainsbury. He says, course. EU membership means open-door immigration, which means more mouth to feed, which means more business for Sainsbury. Because we know how Europe loves its but foreigners. But the, yeah. the problem of uh, this MEP was that he, mistake, he, he, he he got it all wrong. He apparently read this uh, 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 item from the Sunday Times, which I hope we have. It says, the headline is, Sainsbury to mastermind pro-Europe campaign. Sainsbury is a labor politician. He got mixed up. It's not the supermarket. <laughs> it's Lord Sainsbury, who is a labor politician, and he is going to lead this uh, campaign against uh, uh, leaving the Europe. Oh, my God. Now, you would think that the guy would say, I'm sorry, oh I made a mistake, God. right? Yeah. Well he, oh. said, well, he said in this next ouch, tweet, ouch. the public affairs team of yeah. Sainsbury just, just rang my office to say they will not fund the Europe Yes campaign. Hope other companies follow suit. Yes. And then it followed on to uh, Facebook as well. Makes, as you you know, can I'm, see I'm, I'm sure the people of the UK are feeling incredibly confident in their, you know, in their politicians. Uh, I love, morning. I love it. Dumb politicians on Twitter. There's, there's so many. There's so many. I and promise actually, to bring Twitter you more. The thing is that Twitter has opened the door to realize who's dumb and who not yes. and who's not. Yes. I'm wondering. I'm wondering if the masses are going to tap into that in the voting booths. That's Good that's question. the million Good dollar question. question. Yes. I really want to learn Japanese, because there are some words in Japanese that just. They, of course, they don't exist in any other language, no. but they're perfect. They describe the situation perfectly, for, like this uh, one that we see on the, on the headline. Right. This one is called the uh, uh, komorebi, which is sunlight filtering through the trees. There's a word for that in Japanese. Komorebi. But this next one I like is even okay. better. Okay, the called next one is? Irusu. Irusu, which means pretending to be out when someone knocks at your door. <laughs> I have done that. I have done that many, many times. <laughs> many, many times. What are you doing this afternoon, Irusu? <laughs> Irusu. Yeah. Okay. Let's take out, let's, I'll try my Japanese accent. Let's say tsundoku, this one, tsundoku. Tsundoku. It's called the act of buying a book and leaving it unread, often piled together with other unread books. I think you're giving ideas of this word sounds like something the Israeli intelligence would, <laughs> would use yeah. to spy. And real quick. Here's another one, yoisho. Yoisho. Which is a word without meaning said when flopping into a chair after a hard day at work. I'm Yosho every day. Okay, I mean, Sally, no, no, sadly all the time we have, but Yosho. Um, <laughs> then when we get back, um, a closer look at sports, folks. The latest on sports. Do stay with us. First, the news. <laughs>
Tel Aviv. Uh, it is Thursday, June 11th, 2015. It is the best bit of the show because it's almost over. And I love everybody in the studio. I love the viewers. I want to go home. But we are joined by the Economy Magazine correspondent, Daniel Roth. Rav Sevier with us in studio as well for sports coming up. But Daniel, you spent the week in Herzliya almost, didn't you? Yes. Okay. In a very nice IDC campus. Tell me. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, which I was surprised, is very, very nice. Very, very nice, and you know, for the sake of full disclosure, I teach there, it's an amazing campus. Yes, yeah, it, it looks like a futuristic kibbutz. Yes, it really does, <laughs> <laughs> it really, really does. Their square is called Selkum Square. Uh, yes. But um, uh, that said, what is the IDC Hutzlia yeah. Conference? So this is a huge, kind. it's big, it's one of the biggest in the region, uh, dealing with diplomacy, politics, economics, uh, and with some of the world leaders on these fronts. And uh, we had the opportunity to sit down with Adrian Wooldridge, who is the uh, management editor right. of, uh, of The Economist. Uh, and he told us about a lot of really interesting perspectives. That Let's has. have a listen. Yeah, there are three trends, really. One is technology, which is hugely disrupting. Um, the economy, but it's not just disrupting the obvious technology industries, it's spreading its effects out to other industries. So you see something like Uber changing the, the taxi industry. Many, many very stable sort of industries like education and healthcare are going to be disrupted by technological innovation. That's the first. The second one is globalization, the emergence of emerging markets now making up more than half of glo global GDP. Very rapid growth in India and China. That's just changing the balance of. Uh, of the world economy, so global companies have to look more and more at emerging markets. And finally, just the capital markets, you know, the amount of money that's whizzing around the world and the instability created by the capital markets is, is a huge, huge factor. So uh, what are the trends that, you know, you can, you, you can say he basically highlighted or that are highlighted as the economic trends that we're looking at over the course of the next year? Uh, the number one, first and foremost yeah, is, thing, the most important thing that he's talking about and he goes on to talk about uh, much more in depth is tech. It's the advent of the sharing economy, it's algorithms rather than material ownership that right. are making people billions of dollars. Uh, it, Uber being his example that they don't own anything. They don't own taxis, they don't own uh, taxi depot, they don't uh, they don't have employees, according to them. Uh, they don't pay their employees benefits. Uh, they don't. Uh, it's it, a brave new world, right? Uh, yeah. But but what they do do, and they've got billions of dollars because of it, and they're investing it in all kinds of different projects. Uh, they have an algorithm, and that has made them among the the leading uh, tech companies right. on earth. Uh, and all they have is an algorithm, and that's the one of the biggest shifts he's talking about that we have to kind of get used to. That we to. can get used to that what? That when, we, when it comes to the progress of tech that, uh, I'm going to simplify this now, that we're not going to need people to operate what you know is consumed by 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 the population, it's going to be an algorithm. It, it, in different it, cases, it says, different yes. things. It's uh, a lot of the new companies we're going to see are going to have many fewer employees. Right. You know, uh, one of the examples is I think uh, Kodak used to employ something like. 80,000 people in the U.S. Uh, and were replaced by Instagram, based, you know, no, if you yeah. if you kind of think about it that way. No, and I just Instagram realized Kodak and, must be dead. Yeah, yeah. And Instagram, yeah. I think, employs like 50 people. Um, so this is a real thing, you know, uh, they're testing right now self-driving trucks, truck driving being... What does that uh, mean for the economy of third world countries? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. What does that mean if, you know, if things become more available and take less people to employ, to make them available for the greater public, once again, simplifying this in terms, in layman's terms, then what does that mean for populations around the world? That's kind of a terrifying question, huh? It's, yeah. it's a terrifying question, <laughs> uh, and it's one of the reasons so many people these days are talking, it's bubbling up, uh, this conversation about a universal basic income. Uh, which is something in some circles is taking place on national levels, in some circles is taking place on global levels because uh, there are working class and middle class people who exactly. are going to lose their jobs by the millions in the next few decades. Uh, probably many of in those the next jobs, twenty years, probably yeah, in the next yeah. Absolutely, many 
of those jobs will be will be replaced with other jobs. So so if you're not a um, car mechanic, you may become a solar panel mechanic, gotcha. for example. But uh, in a, in millions in of cases, world, yeah. yes, uh, <laughs> in millions of cases that won't happen. So the question is, uh, how are people going to live if labor and wealth are are uh, are, are disconnected? Disconnected. disconnected. Uh, wow. And the the only answer is really kind of sharing. <laughs> Good luck on that one, human. Yes. Yeah, mankind. <laughs> um, uh, what else when it, when it comes to the Herzliya conference? Any more? Any highlights? Because you said world leaders have arrived, but there weren't that many world leaders this time around. I not think. not that yeah. not this time around. One of the big talks of the town, one of the most interesting panels that I went to, and something that uh, Adrian Wildridge spoke about was uh, Israel's economy, uh, where Israel is at as a tech economy, okay. mixed with uh, mono monopolistic economy, <laughs> mixed with the, sort of the global trend right now of talking about boycotts and such. And such. Um, fascinating and, and wonderful that you were there and, and brought this all to our attention. You know, yeah. the week of summits, that's what and now as the world is gonna, you know, basically be operated by an algorithm. Um, fabulous. <laughs> Daniel Roth, um, uh, sorry, one more thing, the G7 also culminated this week. Right? Yes, the G7, exactly. so... Uh, I've... Marav, I keep rushing to get to you, but it's... not yet. <laughs> yes, I know, there you go. This always happens to me. <laughs> uh, the G7 happened this week. A uh, very big promise was made. Yeah, what was that promise? <laughs> Not that uh, we're little, yeah, ye of little faith here. Yeah. Yes, uh, so these the G7 leaders promised that the world would be off fossil fuels. Okay, this is great because we all know climate change is an yes, yes. uh, impending disaster, and we've seen disasters already take place. They've promised that this will happen in 85 years. Uh, in 85 years is when they're saying that this can happen. Now, uh, you're seeing certain countries like Germany, one fossil of the members fuel. of the G7, yeah. uh, uh, move off fossil fuels much, much quicker okay. uh, on a national level. But uh, one of the really big challenges is that we don't have 85 years. According to most of the experts, 85 years is much too long to wait. We're hovering near our two degree above, above the, uh, the yeah. temperature pre-industrial temperature limit uh, and there's a lot of experts that say 85 years just isn't going to cut it and uh, and it's understandable you don't want to uh, create policy that's going to shake people's lives too hard but the truth is that climate change is going to do that if we don't do it through policy see you know what I, I believe you I think that you know the majority of them um, of the world sadly well it doesn't really listen to Daniel Roth as they should but you know it's it, true it, the majority of the, majority the world doesn't, doesn't listen, to listen to you <laughs> uh, but I think it's very important to know that yes if we do not have those 85 years and as you mentioned the two degrees above but I want to thank you for bringing us death destruction and the lack of yes cancer. no jobs yeah, no jobs nothing everything is under, and weather <laughs> Um, okay. Good morning. Uh, yeah, and Daniel Roth, yeah, Economy Magazine. Do watch it every single day on I-24 News at? At 7.10. At 7.10. <laughs> but now, thank God, Marav Severe. I with, like that sentence. Thank God, Marav Severe. <laughs> Marav Severe with sports. Oh, my God. Yes. Sure. Uh, well, as you've mentioned already several times, it's Thursday, which means yes. it's nearing the end of the week. So uh, we took a look back at some of the best moments from this week. So we'll Is start from happy, there. No, it's a, it's a, it's it's a happy story. It's a happy most story. Of it's, most of it's uh, happy, at least funny. Isn't that ha sports. <laughs> the week that wasn't sports. There you go. Let's see the highlights. This was another week featuring top performances around the world. Tennis stars Stan Wawrinka and Serena Williams, Formula One driver Lewis Hamilton, and the super fast horse American Pharoah all claimed trophies in their respective sports. So pick your favorite star of the week. We begin with the men's French Open where Stan Wawrinka battled Novak Djokovic in the finals. Despite going down in the first set, the Swiss player showed perseverance and strength to upset the world number one. Wawrinka served for match point and beat the Serbian with a brilliant backhand down the line to win the French Open. The two players joined at the net and hugged at the end of what was a fantastic match. This was a special win for Wawrinka as he collected his second major title after winning the Australian Open last year. Staying with tennis, we move to the women's final where Serena Williams battled Lucy Safarova of the Czech Republic. 
While Serena finished the first set 6-3, Safarova was relentless and came back to take the second 7-6. But as we all know, when it comes to determination, the American is fierce and mighty. Williams finished the match winning the third and decisive set, 6-2, to take another impressive title in Roland Garros. The American champion was ecstatic that she lifted her 20th Grand Slam trophy. Next, we move to Formula One, where the world champion Lewis Hamilton came into Canada focused and ready to reassert his dominance in the sport. On a quest to win his second successive world championship, he drove around the circuit Gilles Villeneuve on Montreal's Isle Notre Dame, where he earned his first Grand Prix win in 2007. The Mercedes driver took the checkered flag with speed to win his fourth Canadian Grand Prix. They're off in the Belmont Stakes. Well, the next one is not exactly an athlete, but still deserves a lot of praise after claiming a historic triple crown by winning the Belmont Stakes. After previously winning the Kentucky Derby and Preakness Stakes earlier this year, American Pharoah captured the triple crown, which has not been done since 1978. American Pharoah, ridden by Victor Espinosa, soared to victory in front of 90,000 fans. Of the four stellar champions, Walrinka claimed the French Open. Serena Williams lifted her 20th Grand Slam trophy. Lewis Hamilton won the Grand Prix in Canada, and American Farrow won the 147th running of the Belmont Stakes. It's now time for you to choose your favorite star of the week. Boing. So who's your favorite? Oh, wow. I'm, I'm going to have to be, you know, let's say Serena, of course, because she's my age and wears pinks and, wing, and, when, and you know, wears pink and wins everything. still look like that. Yes. Well, uh, okay. well since Michael but. was so kind as to bring us those, I'm going to focus on a couple other athletes who had incredible weeks or maybe not so good weeks if we're going to talk about FIFA later on. Oh, yes. Uh, but we're going to start with our Cleveland Cavalier point guard, uh, Matthew De La Vidova. He... Della Vedova. Vedova. Okay. okay. So <laughs> he's basically emerged from the shadows in these finals because of injuries to other players, and right. he has captured the headlines throughout the U.S. and since he's Australian, oh, overseas as well. He's not yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> he's absolutely Steph Curry, MVP, one of the greatest players on the court. He's basically shut him down in games two and three. The people are saying that they don't know what to do with him. He's a 24-year-old. He makes the least amount of money out of everybody in the finals, drives a Mazda to work <laughs> every day, which I would be okay with. Power to but, poor people. Yeah. Okay, but he's sorry. been able to come out and make this stand, and they've won games two and three. A lot of it is credited to him, and he's become this overnight sensation in sports in the basketball I have a world. He's not going to be driving a Mazda next year. I hope for him yeah. not, and I hope it's not just you know a finals thing. And then you know we saw also happen to Jeremy Lin. He was in sen sensation for a season, and then he kind of like faded few, out. There of is 15 uh, minutes of fame in, in basketball. There as is well. there is such a thing as 15 there. minutes of fame, but he he did uh, suffer from dehydration after game three. Was in the hospital for dehydration. Him and uh, uh, Iman Shumpert were both in the hospital. Iman Shumpert got an MRI, but they're both okay to win the, to play. They just said right. it's um, it's just a bruised left shoulder, so they both will be and back to game after dehydration game, after a game he, he had no ivs he was play that much. yeah exactly <laughs> now so he's <laughs> who knew he's never much. played that much and look at what I'm you're doing used to this yeah okay so he he will be playing in game four him and iman champar will both be playing in game four which is tonight in cleveland they will be monitoring his minutes though so we're going to see how that works out he's been able to shut down steph curry on the court he hasn't been making nearly as many baskets defensively he's been amazing and he scored a I believe 20 points in this last game a couple nights ago. Him. So um, not only if you look at him, uh, he's Australian and his hometown is renaming a gym after him. It's going to be called the De La Vidova Dome. Uh, <laughs> say that 10 times fast. <laughs> Try and say that three times fast now. Okay. All right. Yeah. And now to people who are having less of a good week, FIFA. <laughs> they're having a couple of really, really bad weeks. I think they're weeks. having less of a good life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're already in their older ages, so at least it's coming now. Um, so yesterday, uh, the Swiss authorities already, they went in and they seized computer data, IT data, from Sepp Blatter himself, uh, Jerome just Falk, and from uh, the major... Um, from the authorities right. and the governing body. This came just hours after they announced they will be delaying the 2026 uh, World Cup bid, and that's what Let, Let's take about. a look real quick. I just want uh, to say that um, in the meantime, uh, is it true? It is true. I mean, whatever is happening at FIFA, whatever is discussed at FIFA, whatever is said and discussed about FIFA, the World Cup has to be um, 
protected. The World Cup is uh, all the basic system of FIFA in order to develop football around the world. Nothing was big enough during the process to say that um, the final decision was uh, not uh, uh, in line with all the rules and regulation, regulations which have been uh, in place. And in fact, it's the same conclusion Michael Garcia had uh, in this report. The story that will keep on giving, I think. That you know. will absolutely keep on giving now that we have to wait till the bid. They have to clean up their name before they can bid for any other city because who's going to believe them and it's not going to be corrupt next Nobody. time? Nobody. And it's going to be interesting to see how this falls down um, and let the chips fall where they may. Mirav, thank you for being here. Daniel Roth, always a pleasure for depressing us. Of course, do not forget to tune in I 24 News Morning Edition. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, all those social networks. And of course, tomorrow morning, tune in for another edition of your Morning Edition, the place to be because you just should. And now the news.